Welcome. This is what is happening on the sun today, the 2nd of October 2011. We have a ring of active regions stretching all the way around the northern hemisphere of the sun, and ones on the nearest side of the sun are producing C flares and the occasional M flare. But first our trivia question. Everybody knows that in 1925, a Scottish inventor, Logie Baird, demonstrated the first black and white television. Can you say when the first colour television was demonstrated and by whom? The answer will be given at the end. Since yesterday, we've had two C flares and an M flare. Once again, regions 1302 and 1305 have been largely responsible. But first I'd like to address the issue that's come up several times in emails in that uh, there's been a claim that there's been a huge X flare as a result of this comet crashing into the sun. Let me put that to rest once and for all. There was no X flare and the comet didn't crash into the sun. Well, how do I know? Because I can prove it. Let's take a look, quick look at that before we get on with the normal forecast. The arrow here shows approximately the time when the comet should have impacted the sun. If you can see an X flare you have better eyesight than I do. What is happening here is that the person that started this silly rumour doesn't know the difference between a, a flare and a coronal mass ejection. Here's a montage showing the progress of the comet towards the sun. This is taken from the stereo ahead spacecraft, so the Earth is on the left in these images. And the second montage is from the other spacecraft, the stereo B spacecraft, but the appearance of the comet is much fainter. However, between the two men with some simple geometry, you can work out how far from the sun the um, comet was over this period of time. These images plus the SOHO data show that the comet was coming in from below the ecliptic and would have impacted the western hemisphere of the sun. I've constructed a plot here of how far the comet was from the sun as a function of time throughout the 1st of October. And you can see from the first five points that it's very nicely accelerating towards the sun as it should. But the last two points show that it's almost stopped and is then drifting away slowly from the sun. How can that be possible? Well, from using extrapolation, I can tell when the comet should have, quote, splashed down. And that should have been around somewhere about 18 to 1900 UT. But if we look at the stereo ahead core 1 images, we can see why this occurred. You can see the comet coming in from the left hand side here. That the comet is very close to the sun at uh, 20 hundred hours. That's after the impact time. And you can see that it's higher than the center of the sun, which shouldn't be the case and it is still to the uh, Earth side of the Sun, which again shouldn't be the case if it's already should have passed a perihelion, nor is its tail pointing away from the centre of the Sun, as it should. These are all clues, and I think if you look at the movie here, you can see what has happened. <clears throat> Note how the comet's tail becomes more diffuse and seems to drift away from the Sun. I'll show the movie two more times without the arrows this time, so you can see it more clearly. Here is my hypothesis as to what happened. As the comet approached the sun, it disintegrated, and all its ice melted and became vapour. That vapour became ionised by the solar radiation, and then was swept up in the uh, solar wind, so it drifted away from the sun. So the comet didn't hit the sun, so it couldn't have caused a flare, which wasn't a flare, it was a coronal mass ejection and besides which the coronal mass ejection was on the eastern side of the sun, not the western side of the sun. Uh, and the timing was several hours after this impact should have occurred. So all in all, the whole idea that the uh, comet caused this uh, coronal mass ejection is completely flawed. Now let's return to normal once we discovered what normal is. And we find that there are five numbered regions on the disk at the moment. We lost 1301 overnight but they've added region 1308 down in the southwest. There are two unnumbered regions on the disk, though I have a question about one of them which we'll talk about in a minute. So let's start with region 1302 in the northwest. This is still a very large region, but there seems to be some decay. A small spot to the south of the second leading spot has detached itself and is moving further west, and there's been some decay in the trailer part of the region. It has, however, produced one sea flare in the last 24 hours. Region 1305 has certainly grown uh, and has produced the one M flare that we've had in the last 24 hours. For those of you who like numerology, this is a rather nostalgic combination of having 1302 and 1305 next to each other. Those are the numbers of the two Skylark rockets I fired from Woomera back in the 70s when I was doing my PhD. So that's rather a spooky coincidence for me. 
Next we'll turn to regions 1306 and 1307, which haven't changed a great deal in the last 24 hours, nor have produced any significant flares. The newly numbered region is region 1308 in the southwest. There is a large set of spots coming over the northeast, which still hasn't been numbered as yet. And there seems to be something coming over the southeast limb, but I've not been able to see any spots yet. Using Hevia seismology techniques from the HMI instrument, we can see there are two huge spots on the far side of the sun. So in about a week's time, they should be appearing over the northeast limb. In both the sunspot and magnetic movie from the HMI instrument on the Solar Dynamics Observatory, I would focus on the development of regions 1302 and 1305. I think they're by far the most interesting things going on at the moment. We still seem to be having problems with the AIA instrument uh, data, so I'm going to just show the movies here for your enjoyment, but not really make a lot of comments on them. I have put in a complaint to the contractor, and hopefully they'll get their act together and uh, give us the data as they should be doing. However, I did find this beautiful combination movie from the AIA instrument of the coronal mass ejections from 1305 and 1302. In the high temperature SXI movie, there's a beautiful uh, cusp loop just to the south of region 1302, which again means that there is likely a coronal mass ejection from this region. Not only are we having problems with the AIA data from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, but we're also having problems from the LASCO instrument on SOHO. At least the ACE instrument seems to be working, giving us information about the solar wind. The temperature doesn't seem to have changed a great deal in the last 24 hours, but as predicted, the solar wind has dropped in speed after an initial rise, probably from that coronal hole and the density made a major jump about uh, 12 hours ago. The high energy electron flux at geosynchronous altitudes seems to be varying quite significantly and the proton event at long last seems to be over. The auroral oval seems quite agitated, however it is significantly smaller than it was yesterday. The KP index has been varying between 1 and 3 which is relatively quiet. NOAA is currently carrying no uh, space weather warnings. So in summary then, the X-ray background has risen to the B6 level. The sunspot numbers remained about the same at 86. Radio sun intensities remained about the same at 137 solar flux units. The solar wind speed is at 430 kilometers per second with a density of about two protons per cubic centimeter. And geospace conditions are rated as quiet. So my forecast for the next 24 hours is that C flares are likely, M flares are possible, X flares are unlikely. The sunspot number is likely to go higher coronal mass injections remain likely, and geomagnetic storms are possible. In the longer term we can see that there are no major regions due back over the east limb for another seven days. The answer to the trivia question is that the first colour television was demonstrated in 1928, also by Logie Baird. I do like the quote which demonstrates complete lack of understanding of the impact of what was being shown to him from a newspaper editor when Baird turned up to be interviewed about his invention. He said, for God's sake, go down to reception and get rid of that lunatic who's down there. He says he's got a machine for seeing by wireless. Watch him, he may have a razor on him. Oh well. That's it for today. Keep safe. Bye for now. <laughs>